in this pre-lecture video we're going to be talking about the beginning part of chapter 11 which covers the idea of static equilibrium. Now the main idea here, and we've talked about mechanical equilibrium before, in that there, if there's no net force acting then an object is in mechanical equilibrium. That is, before we talked about rotations, if an object did not have a linear acceleration then its state of motion was not changing and therefore um, there was no net force acting on it and we would call that equilibrium even if it was moving so remember something with constant velocity could still be in equilibrium the same is true here now we're just adding in what we know about um, rotation and so you have equilibrium if the sum of forces is equal to zero and the sum of torques is equal to zero because if you just have the sum of forces equal to zero but there is a net torque then you do have an angular acceleration um, and vice versa you can have no net torque in which case something might won't have an angular acceleration but you can have a linear acceleration so to be in true equilibrium you have neither um, a tangential acceleration or a linear acceleration or sorry or, or a angular acceleration so you then use this in problem solving and conceptually in order to make sense of problems so you have to look at the sum of forces and the sum of torques um, and then you would set them equal to zero because it's an equilibrium situation all right so the best way to see how this works is to just look at an example and in class you'll do more examples as well all right so for an example um, let's say that we just have a beam, sort of like a seesaw, that's balanced here at this pivot point. And you're told that the board is a uniform density. So that lets you know that the center of mass is right in the middle. And in this case, then, that would be right above this pivot. Um, the mass of the board is 20 kilograms. And then it has these masses that are placed as shown and a 100 newton force acting as shown. So this 100 newton force um, then is acting 30 degrees to the horizontal. And the question is, what must the mass be here, m, so that the board is balanced horizontally? And then further, when it is balanced, what are the vertical and horizontal forces acting on the board from the pivot point? Okay, so to start, what must the mass be? Well, we know that in order to balance this board, we need to have this mass then end up acting to balance the torque from this side. So these ones will cause a counterclockwise rotation, these will cause a clockwise rotation, and so those torques need to be balanced. The torque from this um, mat beam itself is going to be zero because it has no lever arm, it's acting at the pivot location. So we can use the sum of torques in order to figure out part A. We can't use the sum of forces because we don't actually know yet what the vertical and horizontal forces are acting on the board and we need to know the mass m in order to get those. Alright, so for part a then we can use the sum of torques. So we can say that the sum of torques again vector torques equals zero and we remember that torque is equal to r cross f which was equal to r times the component of f that was perpendicular to r. So in the case of this force, that would be your r here from the pivot to the force, and then the component of this force that's perpendicular. So that would be this leg then of that triangle. So that's equal to then r times f times the sine of the angle between them. In this case, you are given the angle between them, and you can see the sine of 30 does indeed give the perpendicular component. But you need to be the one to verify that for every problem. Okay, so then we can say that the sum of torques then is going to be equal to, and let's put these as the positive direction for a counterclockwise direction. Again, it doesn't matter which you choose as long as you choose an opposite sign for these as for these because they're causing different types of rotation and they need to be balanced. So for this one here, the two kilogram, we know that it's going to be a distance of four meters away and then for the weight, I'm going to just call that um, 2 and then g. So this is equal to our mg, that's our force, and this is equal to r. And then the sine of phi is going to be 90 degrees. 
right, times the sine of 90, which is just 1. And then plus the 1 for the mass, which is going to be equal to 2 times mg, where what we want is m. And then now minus, because these on this side of the beam are pointing in the opposite counterclockwise, sorry, clockwise direction versus counterclockwise um, to cause that rotation. And so for this one, remember it was 100 newtons. And so that's going to then be a distance of 4 away times 100 times the sine of 30 degrees. And again, the only reason I could use sine is because the angle they provided gives me the component that is indeed perpendicular to my lever arm. And then that's going to be equal to zero. So I can now solve for m. And so m is going to be equal to 4 times 100 times the sine of 30 minus 4 times 2g over 2 times g. And then when I plug in for g equaling 9.8 and solve this, you end up with 6.2 kilograms. So then that's our answer for part a. Once we know what that mass is, right, we know now what that mass is, then we have a clear picture of all of these forces acting here, and we know the weight of the beam. So now we can determine what the horizontal and vertical forces acting at the pivot will be. Note that the vertical force would be a normal force because it's a contact force that's basically serving for support. And a horizontal force, it might not at first be obvious that there might be a horizontal force at a pivot point. But that would be then a force of friction. If it's static equilibrium, that would be a force of static friction that can act horizontally in case the horizontal forces are not balanced as they are. Okay, so for part B, we need to say that the sum of forces in the x direction is zero and the sum of forces in the y direction are zero. And at this point, it's useful to draw a separate free body diagram that includes the horizontal and vertical forces from the pivot. So over here we had our 2 kilogram mass, so it's going to have 2g as its weight. We know that the mass m that we just solved for is going to be 6.2 times g for mg for that. And then at the pivot we have the downward force of the weight which would be 20 times g for 20 kilograms times g. And then we have our force, sorry, acting at an angle downward. That was 100 newtons acting at 30 degrees. And then from this, you can see all of these are downward forces. So the normal force certainly has to be upward. And then we can then say also, if we look at these, and it's going to depend um, which way you know, how you, you balance these out, um, how this horizontal component compares to um, these. And you can see that these have no horizontal component. So this one here very clearly has a leftward horizontal component, which means that there has to be a rightward horizontal component of static friction to balance this. And if there was no static friction possible, then this board would then have an acceleration in the negative x direction. Okay, so we can start with the sum of forces in x, which are going to be equal to the force of static friction, which is one of the things that we want, minus 100 times the cosine of 30 degrees. And again, that's this horizontal component of this 100 Newton force that's acting. And that's going to be equal to zero. So as I was saying, this force of static friction to the right is going to balance this horizontal component of that 100 Newton force. So that's going to be equal to 100 times cosine of 30, which is equal to 86.6 .6 Newtons in the positive x direction. And now if we look at the sum of forces in y, 
we can then get what the normal force is. And so we have the only force pointing up is the normal force, and then minus the vertical components of all of these. So that would be minus 2g, minus 6.2g, minus 20g, and then minus the vertical component of this, which was 100 times the sine of 30. And that's going to then equal 0. And if you then solve for n by just plugging in 9.8 for g and solving for what the net downward force is, then the normal force has to counter that. And that then comes out to be 326.4 um, newtons. So you can see from our original problem that you can use the sum of torques to get information about balancing your torques and how far something must be from the pivot. The forces doesn't take into account any of these distances, right? But the torques do. So whenever a problem asks about how far something must be or what happens when something moves, say, across a beam, then you know you're going to be having to think about torques. When you're talking about forces at a pivot, then the torque there is zero, so you're going to then have to start talking about your sum of forces. And usually you use them in conjunction with each other to learn about the system as a whole. Now the last thing that I'm going to say is that if we go back to this basic definition of equilibrium, that the sum of forces is zero and the sum of torques is zero. In the previous problem, we had a very clear pivot point about which to take the sum of torques. But what's important to note when you're doing problem so solving is that the sum of torques is going to be equal to zero about any point. Because if it wasn't, then you would have an angular acceleration around that point and you would no longer have equilibrium. So when you are doing problem solving, you want to be um, able to choose your pivot wisely, but ultimately you will have a net torque of zero around any point. Okay, that concludes this pre-lecture video. If you have any questions, please let me know.